Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Uh, good morning again. This is Jonathan Small, host and producer of All About You. Today is April the 22nd, 2013. This show is broadcast live from Access TV.org studios in downtown Hartford. Again, this show is designed to have my guest give his life story. Today we're going to actually have a very special topic. Our guest is coming all the way from New Jersey, and I really appreciate him driving that distance to come here to be on this show. And he's pretty much going to give a broad range of our topic today. Basically, does America have the moral fitness to survive? Uh, my guest this morning is Dennis Speed. He is the executive intelligence. He is the let me get this correct. The exec. He is the writer for Executive Intelligent Magazine. Good morning, Dennis Speed. How you doing? How you doing? I'm doing all right. Happy to be here. Okay. Could you briefly let people know who you are and where did your life get started at? Sure. I, I was born in Chester, Pennsylvania, which is uh, just south of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, old industrial area, which has now been deindustrialized like much of the rest of America, including Hartford. Okay. I became uh, involved in politics at the age of 19, uh, actually a little bit earlier, but officially, so to speak. And in that context, I was at college at the time, got involved with uh man by the name of Lyndon LaRouche. Some people have heard of him. He was a, he's a statesman and economist as well. And uh, I took some classes from him. He founded the Executive Intelligence Review magazine back in 1974. Mm -hmm. And this was at the time done because we thought, those of us who were previously activists, either with black nationalist movement or with the anti-war movement and so on, that Americans at that time mm -hmm. were completely in the dark about the real agenda that seemed to be emerging at the time, coming particularly from American and, more importantly, European and American financial forces. Mm -hmm. uh, so we founded this magazine, and it was a, it's was a been a weekly that's been in existence since 74. It'll be going into its 40th year next year. Okay. Now, pretty much um, anybody can get a copy of this magazine anywhere throughout the country? Yeah, well, it's not really on newsstands. It's online, of online. course, Executive Intelligence Review. And also, if people are interested in looking at some of the back articles and a lot of the research that we've done over time, uh, they can go onto the web and they look up uh, LaRouche Pub, L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E, LaRouche, Lyndon LaRouche, LaRouchePub.com. And that gives you access to a lot of the archival material that we accumulated over four decades. Okay. Now, we have a very special topic this morning. Uh, does America have the moral fitness to survive? And a lot has probably gotten better or worse probably since 1974 when you started this particular organization. That, that's an interesting question. Actually, things have generally gotten far worse. Okay. Uh, and although, in some respects, uh, people have asserted that there's a better financial or economic circumstance for Americans. Uh, that, that itself is, I think, uh, highly dubious. In fact, there is a difference, first of all, between finances and economy. Mm -hmm. And you, when you look at cities in America like Hartford, Camden, New Jersey, Chester, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and for that matter, Detroit, Philadelphia, yes. or virtually any major urban center, what you see is something that's rather important to recognize. There was a time uh, prior to particularly 1971 when the notion uh, of growth, economic growth, economic development was that urban centers were the center of the United States or should be the productive center of the United States and the populations that were within, the, within those urban centers, if mm -hmm. they became skilled, could look forward to uh, a higher living standard and they could look forward to greater economic stability. Mm -hmm. But in fact, what has emerged in particular in the last 15 years, generally in American life for African Americans, for uh, white people, for uh, uh, new immigrants, which are largely non-white, is that there's greater economic instability. Mm -hmm. Rather than a greater rootedness, there's more unrootedness. There's more transience. 
And so when you begin to look actually at how this has evolved in American history, you see that the forces of what some people call finance capital, but I think should just be called monetarism, moneyism, if you want to put it that way, have now created a situation where virtually despite your skill level and often despite your ethnic background, there's no permanence that comes by or accrues to you because of the development of the skills, talents, or morality of the individual. And the reason I thought that this topic, uh, does America have the moral fitness to survive, was so interesting, mm -hmm. is that if you reach a point where a population is sending the signal to its young people that no matter what your efforts are, no matter wh what you do to overcome whatever may be the in inefficiency, insufficiencies in your background, inadequacies in your background, you will not only not get ahead, mm -hmm. you may slide behind. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, then the, si the society has lost its mor moral moorings. And uh, the notion that there is something that's not permitted to people, uh, the notion that there's crime in, in, in their attempting to pursue an alternate path, this disappears. Mm -hmm. So now criminal behavior can become actually the standard of economic and financial success. Mm. Would, if you have the ability to put in your mindset that you could become liberated and, and empowered, would that be something that could kind of offset the challenges and obstacles that you're facing here? Well, I think if you've got a society that is structurally for, formatted so that your attempts to do that penalize you, mm -hmm. I'd say no. If you have a society, in other words, where you have the largest banks becoming larger after they're actually bailed out, despite the fact that according to the tenets of so-called free market capitalism, mm -hmm. that's exactly what you don't do. In other words, the supposedly the venture capitalist gets to keep his massive, often obscene profits because he will be penalized if he makes the wrong venture mm -hmm. and he, his business will go bankrupt. Well, we just saw that principle violated mm -hmm. in 2007, 2008. Right. These people should all, by dint of the principles that we were, called, we were told free market capitalism operates on, they should have all been go gone out of business. They mm -hmm. all, sh all should have been bankrupted and there should have been no bailouts. Mm -hmm. Instead, they were bailed out. So they were rewarded for failing. And not only were they rewarded for failing, they've now gotten bigger and there's a greater stratification now uh, between them and the people that bailed them out. Mm -hmm. who are many people in the poorest communities of America. So now there's a problem here, which is that the moral of that story seems to be that reckless and even criminal activity on the part of those with great power yes. is to be rewarded, not punished. Well, what does that say for the average citizen then? If the average person is coming along trying to do the best he can do uh, on the immense tremendous obstacles, uh, just trying to get a job, just trying to further your um, education. Where does all of these issues affect that average citizen? This is exactly what the problem becomes. Uh, if you have citizens that are now required to uh, work at three jobs mm -hmm. to attempt to maintain a living standard that their grandparents or parents were able to maintain with one job, yes. first of all, their ability to even correct the problem in the society tends to be hampered by their having to be completely involved, psychologically particularly, mm -hmm. in just making ends meet, just mere, mere subsistence. Yes. So that citizenship, and by which we would mean the kind of citizenship that we saw exhibited by Martin Luther King, becomes penal, uh, 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 something you can only do it by penalty. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a liability to act freely as a citizen to correct an injustice because you're going to have a financial downside to that, which could, in fact, be fatal because you're, 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 you're living hand to mouth. Right. Well, you say America, uh, we don't have the moral fitness to survive. That's a real challenge. Uh, sometime when we look back at what took place in 2005 with the Hurricane uh, Katrina in New Orleans and the people were without food and water for basically four days, uh, is there any possibility that this country could be moving in a direction that people might find themselves not having access to food and water and the basic uh, necessities? I think you're there now. I think that's one of the uh, ironically uh, hopeful 
elements of the present circumstance that we're in. We're actually at a situation now mm -hmm. where if people don't begin to act, you, you, you'll see a, a reduction of our food supply. Mm -hmm. You'll see a reduction of, of course, health care, because one of the things that people are now exp experiencing, even after the so-called Obamacare got implemented, is that cancer patients, for example, throughout the United States, about a million of them are now experiencing that they are no, no longer eligible for treatments that they were able to get two years ago. Mm -hmm. One can say that's because of Obamacare. I happen to think it is, but I think there's another element here. I believe that what you've got as a whole is a breakdown in the United States, a kind of a physical breakdown crisis. If we look at our roads, our bridges, our highways, our tunnels, our dams, mm -hmm. what what's called, called infrastructure, not merely in the cities, but throughout the country as a whole. Yes. For example, you look at the, the age of water pipe in the United States. There's about a million miles of water pipe that's older than 85 to 90 years. Mm -hmm. But that stuff is, it, it, and, or it should only go up to its general life expectancy is about 47 to 50. Okay. So that's throughout the country. So mm -hmm. if you're in a rural area, that will be true, as true as it is in an urban area. Mm -hmm. Because we're at that point, I think that we are able to actually now pose to American citizens a kind of life or death scenario that they can begin to document on their own mm -hmm. or experience on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to that degree, I think we've got a, a, a hopeful situation. So I believe that we're in a situation where that kind of scarcity that you talked about, about lack of clean water, for example, yeah. lack of adequate food, we already have that. Uh, you can't even shop in many African-American uh, neighborhoods, for example, mm -hmm. uh, for these things. Uh, for the right kind of food stuffs. This means that we have entered into a situation where our citizens are being confronted literally with whether or not they can buy medicine or food. Education for their children becomes a, a peculiar proposition because where are the jobs? Mm -hmm. what, what, what are you even trying to do? If you were even being educated to get a job, right. which is itself an interesting question whether or not that's even the purpose that education should serve. That's one purpose that education should serve. But is that all it's about? Mm -hmm. so, the, so, the, so, the, so what I'm trying to suggest here is that we find ourselves in a kind of what you could call an existential circumstance, a circumstance where what, do, what does all this even mean? Mm -hmm. what, what are we even trying to do as a society? Obviously, individuals have an idea because of their households and so on. Right. What they want to do, mm -hmm. bring up a family. You want to have your children have a better and uh, living standard than you. You want them to have, have better opportunities in life than you. Mm -hmm. You want them to have a future. So the notion of, of, of a future orientation, yeah, sure. Individual families can, can aspire to that. It's sort of like what you were saying before. Mm -hmm. If I aspire to make myself better and if I actually commit myself to that, can't we make a difference? Mm -hmm. Yes, that you can. Right. But can a society that doesn't define actual standards uh, of a future mm -hmm. for its population, can that society make it? And I'm suggesting no society in history which has never, which has not had a conception of a future that it appropriately bequeathed to its younger generations has ever survived. And America will not either unless we change the circumstances radically. Well, these communities that make up this society uh, throughout our country, like South Central LA, Liberty City, Miami, um, Camden, um, New Jersey, Detroit, we're all in the same common uh, scenario that we're dealing with the same realities, even though we live in different parts of the country. Well, I think you have to look at the situation completely differently. I understand what you're asking me. Mm -hmm. But let me point out something to you. Uh, ever since, particularly 1971, mm -hmm. going back now, August 15, 1971, when President Nixon was in the White House, mm -hmm. he took the dollar off the gold standard and he allowed the dollar to float. Now, that seemed to be a monetary measure at the time. But for those of us who were young people at the time and were looking at this and who had gone through Economics 101, this is where Lyndon LaRouche particularly distinguished himself. I remember him giving a debate uh, with an economics professor during that year, the spring of that year. And in the spring of that year, if you had an Economics 101 textbook, it told you there were built-in stabilizers in the American economy, in the world economy, which meant that you could never have the events that happened in 1929 
through 1938 mm -hmm. happened again, the Great Depression. Yes. You could never see a situation where half of the people would be out of work, or where a thousand farms would be closed in one day in Mississippi alone, and half of the people in this place or that place, 95% of the children in West Virginia would have malnutrition. This could never possibly happen again. Mm -hmm. And what was what happened was in spring of seventy one, I was sitting in a in a at Swarthmore College, and when Mr. LaBruche was debating somebody, and he said, "Well, actually, right now, as we speak, mm -hmm. that entire system that you talk about, what you have to say has built in stabilizers, is crumbling before our eyes." Right. Now, by the end of that year, that system had actually ended. But it was a technical shift that Nixon made, so the people didn't understand what had happened. Mm -hmm. Those of us who were studying economics understood that this meant that now deindustrialization was going to happen. Yeah. What, that's what you now have and you see in every American city. Mm -hmm. So we don't make anything in this country anymore. Manufacturing has completely collapsed. About 9% of our population is involved in that, whereas in 1971, we had 43% of our population involved in some kind of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We don't, our, our farmers, which who used to feed the entire world, most of them were put out of business in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. Now you have large cooperative farms, you have these genetically modified foods, you have all sorts of disaster in a sector which was a highly productive sector. Mm -hmm. Now notice, I didn't say anything about South Central LA yet, right, or right. Camden, or any of that, of that. right? There's a reason. See, what happened was, people have talked about something called globalization, mm -hmm. but what people have not recognized that simply meant is that monetary interests from 1971 took a 20 year period to reorganize the economies of every nation in the world. Mm -hmm. The U.S. dollar, which not, now no longer exists, mm -hmm. that thing in your pocket is not really a U.S. dollar. Okay. But that U.S. dollar used to have behind it manufacturing, mining, agriculture, goods production, physical infrastructure, which meant that the dollar had value because the skill levels of its population of the United States mm -hmm represented an actual wealth generating capability which was continually growing. Mm -hmm. That was changed and it was changed as a policy. Okay. Now the people who did it, there are, are, are many in myriad, but the reason I mention them is that none of them came from Camden, New Jersey, right. and none of them came from South Central LA, mm -hmm. and none of them came from West Philadelphia or North Philadelphia or Chester, Pennsylvania generally. Some people may have come, tried to join those people mm -hmm. who came from those places, yes. but that policy didn't come from those places. Okay. And so when we look at these areas today, we can't any longer look at these areas in isolation Further, and now I'll say something that may be controversial, but I have to say it because that's the way I am, mm -hmm. so to speak. Barack Obama and the White House has done more to exacerbate that situation for black people than anybody else. And the reason that that has happened is because that was precisely the intent of his election. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about why he ran and, then, and why he would have wished to run. I'm talking about the aspirations of the people that financed his campaign. Mm -hmm. Whether we're talking about George Soros who put a lot of the money up or Union Bank of Switzerland, that was one of the major places, or a lot of the drug money that came in, which was now from Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank and so forth, that came into both his campaign and, that, and into the Bush campaigns mm -hmm. as well earlier. Yeah. This is not something that originated with Obama, mm -hmm. but it's a policy shift that happened in America, particularly from 1971 through 1991, 92. And then they started that, that was the first phase, mm -hmm. take the dollar off the gold standard. Then in 91, 93, they started what was called globalization. Mm -hmm. And there are many things, I won't go through them all, but North American Free Trade Act, NAFTA, is sort of when all the jobs began to leave America. Yes. People remember this, they sort of talk about jobs going overseas, jobs going to Mexico. Mm -hmm. But you know, what, what was going on was not what it looked like. It wasn't just jobs going from here to there. Because the jobs from Mexico then went to Indonesia, right. and then they went from Indonesia to China. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and so if you go, Mexicans came here because the jobs that they had gotten from the United States in the maquiladoras across the border in places like Monterey, all those jobs absconded and went to other cheap labor markets. Mm -hmm. 
So what was happening is, and what has been happening in these places, this has to be known because if you don't know this, you don't know how to correct it. There is no control in Camden. Mm -hmm. There's no control in South Central LA. There's oh. no control in Detroit. There's right. no control in Buffalo mm -hmm. that people have over their economic security. And they can't get control in Buffalo mm -hmm. or Newark or these other places. Mm -hmm. There's only one thing that they could possibly do, and that's assert political control through a principle. It's associated with a particular law that got passed by Roosevelt during the Depression. Mm -hmm. And that this law was rescinded in 1999. It was called the Glass-Steagall Act. It's just named after two congressmen. One was a senator, one was a representative. But I reference this because what that act said was that we must protect the American people from speculation by banks with their money. Mm -hmm. And when this was repealed in 99, it was being weakened all through the 90s, from 91 through 99, like I was saying, they were weakening all the regulations. Mm -hmm. Once it got repealed, then from there on in, it was a crapshoot as to whether or not and at what year, what era, what time, the whole American economy would be collapsed. Mm -hmm. What you're living in and what I'm living in, in places, whether it's Hartford or Camden and these other places, mm -hmm. we are living through a complete, utter, total, thorough, conscious collapse of American life in favor of people who are in banks looting what we do, have done, in our country. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that the President of the United States, uh, like many others, is not only in collusion with that, they're aiding and abetting that. Well, sometimes you don't hear these type of messages that you're giving to the people out here seen on CNN, even black entertainment uh, network television. Every now and then they may have a special, but on a consistent level through the media forces, you don't really hear that. Amer I mean, you hear sound bites that, you know, America yeah. is in trouble, but you don't hear a long direct um, outline of why America is going in the direction that it's going in. And when you're saying these other places that I mentioned is like the effect that the people that grow up in these places, they don't have any control. Is it almost to say that if you are born and raised in most of these places where we're losing jobs and we're losing businesses and even losing hope that as a collective uh, population base, there's not much other than through the political, I think you mentioned the political system. That is one way that you could change some of these uh, conditions. Well, that's an interesting question. You ask a very good question. First mm -hmm. of all, I would say that American society is more socially stratified now than it's been since 1900. Okay. I'd say in the last 113 years, we have more cl classism, if you want to put right. it that way, that goes on now than before. The peculiar uh, element, twist in America is the role of the African American. Because what happened in the African American community is uh, that the false notion of integration mm -hmm. actually weakened and destroyed the camaraderie and the sense of community mm -hmm. that existed in African American communities. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have had a, a struggle for civil rights. That's right. not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That was all fine. There's no problem with that. But with the way that America responded to that, particularly in the period of about 64 through 69, was with something called, sometimes called the War on Poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, and Johnson may have meant well in his own mind by that. But what actually happened was that the poverty programs that began at the time, which were pacification programs, first initiated by Mac George Bundy uh, of the Ford Foundation in 1964 in a speech in Philadelphia. What occurred was that money was put into these communities for the purpose of hiving out of the communities mm -hmm. Uh, the so-called talented tenth. Now, talented tenth used to mean something when W. E. B. Du Bois used the term back in the 19th century, and he was talking about some uh, approach to elevating uh, African Americans at the time. Mm -hmm. But later, there was a different social policy that was conducted by people at the Ford Foundation and at many other, the Macy Josiah Macy Foundation, many of these foundations. Uh, these are associated with things like prudential insurance and, and uh, the Morgan insurance interest and others. And what they were doing was they wanted to pacify these communities. So what they did to people like myself uh, who were uh, back in the 60s going into college and so on, 
they would give you your SATs and so on, but what they really wanted you to do was to come to their camp campuses and write about the black experience. Mm -hmm. Now you thought what you were doing was establishing the premise of black studies and so forth, and now you're really opening up a, a sort of diversity in curriculum. That's what you thought you were doing. Mm -hmm. What you really were doing was giving them enough ammunition to understand exactly how to hive out, to hollow out, to lobotomize the black community mm -hmm. by putting people who were otherwise, because of segregation, forced to live in the same neighborhoods, you putting them over in Bel Air, Bel -Air. as in Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That's what the joke is about the series. Mm -hmm. But what the series is, 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 is also showing, in a different way, the Jeffersons has a different slice of that, mm -hmm. is a, a destruction, a kind of hollowing out, hmm? a lobotomization mm -hmm. hmm? of the black community. Yes. So now what you do, you pay off these people. And they're over there, and they're, of course, thinking, well, you know, I, I didn't get here because I was black. I got here because I, I was smart. smart. Uh, you know, I, I, I earned my SATs. Yeah, that's what you say. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that the only reason that you're over there on the other side of the ghetto is because they put you there to keep everybody else there. where they are. Where they are right now. Right yes. now. Mm -hmm. Right now. And then, and then what happens is whenever they complain, other than the fact you put three million people in jail, mm -hmm. with America being the most heavily incarcerated society on earth, with the possible exception, maybe, maybe per capita, of a North Korea or a China, and I frankly would dispute that, uh, you now say to the people who grumble in those neighborhoods, mm -hmm. what are you complaining about? You got a black president. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's be straightforward. The last five years, Here's what are the changes we have seen in South Central LA, mm -hmm. South Side Chicago, North End of Hartford, mm -hmm. West Philadelphia, Chester, Pennsylvania, Camden, New Jersey. What have we seen? Mm -hmm. I would argue what we have seen is the same policy, except now accelerating, not because Barack Obama merely is there or something. That's part of it. That's not really it. Mm -hmm. It's because it's time. Mm -hmm. And what they're going to do in these areas is that they are going to attempt to simply remove black people and wherever they happen to end up, more power to them. So you wouldn't have no control growing up in these communities if you don't want to go to a particular place elsewhere. I, I, I'm, I'm saying to you that, that the reason that we're looking at a Jay-Z, a 50 Cent, mm -hmm. Uh, a Russell Simmons, and all of those people start out in drugs. Right. But those people are the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not really commenting about that, but the reason we're seeing that mm -hmm. is because you, you can't, except by dint of extraordinary and unique circumstances, you can't build businesses, local businesses, local manufacturing. There's no, there's no income stream no being directed toward these activities for any of America, mm. not just for black America, for right. any of America, but black America and parts of immigrant America are hit hard and certainly poor white America, which is not even on anybody's radar on this, mm -hmm, That's right? true. on anybody's radar. Th th these people have no possibility of emerging from the conditions that they've been put in unless there's a revolutionary kind of change in America of the type that we hoped would happen back in the 1960s. Well, doesn't the Asians have the highest uh, business ownership throughout our country? They have one of the highest medium household incomes. They have one of the highest educational standards. Wouldn't the Asians be a, somewhat of an example, like they can go into Flushing, Queens, and New York and run a lot of businesses? Yeah, but check out what, you, what you're saying, because it, you, you're saying something a little bit different mm -hmm. depending on who you're talking about. Okay. If you're talking about Koreans, Okay. Koreans are not the Chinese, okay, and they're not the Indians. These are all different things. But notice one other thing. Every one of them comes from a language group mm -hmm. and a culture. Okay. And many of them come from societies where they are pioneers coming from, if not affluent, uh, fair... Uh, uh, middle class level people mm -hmm. from those countries coming here. Right. So they aren't to to equate that in any way with either the African American experience or even the Mexican experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
which is also different than the African Americans because that's also a language group. Yes. It's also a cultural group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's important, and I'm putting it this way because uh, this is often held up as an example of you know hey, the success going on in America is yes. just yes. But here's my point to you. Check this out. Here's my final point, punchline on this. Take China. Now China has largely uh, about 300 million to 400 million people now in that country mm -hmm. who have really obviously done very well. Uh, America owes. China two trillion dollars, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can say all sorts of things about the amazing things that are going on there in that nation in terms of infrastructure building and all kinds of stuff. So there's, there's money flowing in both directions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the Chinese that came here from there seem to be doing very well. There's a billion people in China That's besides true. this. Right, That's it's one point four billion. We're talking about three hundred to four hundred million. That other billion people, mm -hmm. right? Is about to experience a a kind of a kind of reverse uh, progression, a retrogression, because of what's happening in America. Mm -hmm. Because the Chinese have hooked themselves so much into the American economy, as the American economy has begun increasingly to collapse, what's the export market going to be? Market going to be for China? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm saying this to point out the following, because I, I want to make be very clear about the picture I'm painting right. and why I'm painting such an ultimate picture. I'm painting that because I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that African Americans, among others, Americans in general, can reverse this entire process, this entire picture I just gave you, mm -hmm. by doing a couple of things that are not magical. They were done before in this country. Okay. If you just reinstate the laws that we had, like this Glass-Steagall Act, and say, hey, you know what, those banks that we bailed out, Mm -hmm. uh, not only was that wrong, we need that money back. Just take all that capital back. Let them collapse. Mm -hmm. Because the American s banking structures are not the uh, investment banks like uh, Goldman Sachs or, or even AIG was an insurance company. Mm -hmm. The argument was, oh, they were so big they had to... Uh, no, no, because in other words, when it comes to what an economy is as opposed to what a financial system, mm -hmm. economy is what you produce. Right. That's what you grow. That's what you make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, who you are, not who you pretend to be. Mm -hmm. So we could, in fact, and that's what Roosevelt did in 1933, by the way. He came into office on March 4th. He shut the banks on March 6th. He reopened some of the banks, some of them, March 11th. And then he, many of those banks never reopened, mm -hmm. and they just reorganized the monetary system. They gave people relief. They started what's called relief. There was no social security, there was no unemployment insurance, there was no welfare insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, none of that stuff existed. Roosevelt started all that and he, the country did fine. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'm saying is the reason that that is not being done is because the African American has been put in a situation of becoming subjectively paralyzed by watching the radiance of the brilliant Barack Obama, mm -hmm. who actually is an agent for the policy that's eliminating them. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue involved is that's, however, my responsibility, not Barack Obama's. Right. That's our responsibility, not Barack Obama's. Because since he's operating as an agent for policies that are killing us, then our ob 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 obligation is to operate for policies that don't kill us. Mm -hmm. That's what. And then you see how things shake out in the political spectrum as a result of that. Well, could some of these policies be changed in a local level, like who you elect for mayor, who you elect for city council, your state representatives? No. It can't be changed on you that can't. level? What you can do there is you can, you can, you can shock the system mm -hmm. by getting rid of, or we used to call them a lot of things, Uncle Tom was the old <laughs> thing we used to call them, right? Okay. But a lot of incompetent people of various types. And you put in independent people mm -hmm. who have no allegiance to the system in power. Now, by making that shock, that actually doesn't change the policy necessarily. But the shock is useful because then people say, well, wait a minute. I don't have to sit here and just take this. I can change my orientation toward this. Now, I know I'm not with this policy. Mm -hmm. So you will like me because I'm not with this policy. Okay. Okay, now, but to change it... You have to do it nationally. And that's why I keep saying 
you know, you could have also called the program Glass Steagall or Die. I know I'm saying it's Glass Steagall. What's Glass Steagall? It's real simple. I want everybody to follow this. It goes like this. The bank said, you know, we got a problem, and um, if we don't solve our problem, our invest, our depositors have a problem. Mm -hmm. And we say, uh, no, we have a United States government, and we say we don't have a problem if you have a problem. What we will do is we will guarantee the investors, but we will not guarantee you. And all of you, whether you're HSBC, notice all the names. They're all, they're all initials because you don't even know that they're not American. Mm -hmm. HSBC is Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. TD is Toronto Dominion. That's Toronto, Canada. Mm -hmm. UBS is Union Bank of Switzerland. Right. That's why they do that. These things are not American banks. Mm -hmm. So the whole point of the thing is that we're propping up an international system run out of actually London, which we found out for people who didn't know about the LIBOR rate, this London interbank offered rate. Mm -hmm. You may have heard last year that was the big thing, big scandal. That determines your credit card rate. Mm -hmm. That determines the, the rate that you pay on your student loan. Mm -hmm. That determines your car payment. Yeah, mm -hmm. something called the London interbank offered rate. Okay. London Interbank Offer, you don't even know anything about this. Mm -hmm. That thing determines every interest rate set in the world mm -hmm. coming out of London. You didn't know. See? I don't mean this you, period. Yeah, you, 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 you the don't citizen, know. don't know, don't right? Know that. That's true. So what I'm trying to say about this is, here's what we have to do as a citizen. Mm -hmm. Here's my thing. Independent. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat because, you know, that hasn't worked either way as far right. as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. The concept is we say, listen, we're going back to what we had, and we're not bailing anybody out except the people. Mm -hmm. We will bail the people out, but we're not going to do that merely by money. We're going to do that by something called credit. Mm -hmm. You take a city like Hartford, look at the roads, look at the bridges, the highways, like we said. They all need to be rebuilt, all mm -hmm. need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. You need work programs to do that. Plenty of people out there that want to work, and plenty of people that would be able to be apprenticed to do that. Sure, there's a low skill level. Yes, there's a drug problem. Yes, there are health problems and all those other things. But you know what? That's other work that you can also give people to do if you're trying to rebuild manufacturing in this country where we make what we need and export to places like China who have a billion people who need, billion and a half people, fact, matter of fact, what America could produce. Mm -hmm. Chinese people don't have to be selling shoes to Americans. There's at least two and a half billion feet in China. Right. All right? So, so I mean, what is that all about? But Americans could be selling high-speed rail components and locomotive parts and railway ties and all that stuff we used to make. Mm -hmm. We used to know how to make. We could be selling that to China and retire that debt. See, so, you know, this is basically the situation that we could get ourselves into if we chose to take that path. Mm -hmm. And you say this path has to be done on a national level. It can't really be done on a local level. Once you have globalization, mm -hmm. once you have the Internet, right, right, like this show being shown all over the world, exactly. right, why would you just do something local? Now, local is good because everything is local. Mm -hmm. Every idea that anybody has happens in the mind of a single individual. Yes. Right? Every invention ever made started with one person knowing it and nobody else knew it till that person communicated to somebody else. So local is good. Mm -hmm. I'm not against local. What I'm saying is if you are going to act locally, act universally. Right. The guy named Archimedes, our uh, old geometer named Archimedes once said, give me a lever and I can move the world. Mm -hmm. What he meant was that there are times and there are places mm -hmm. where if you do take a little action, all of a sudden everything becomes different. People use the Rosa Parks example as one example of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a good example because it's one little action that changes everything. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that today, right in South Central, right in North End, right in these other areas, if people have a consciousness of what they can do, mm -hmm. all right? and don't get bogged down by the local, okay, infighting and that kind of thing right. which goes on in every community. Mm -hmm. uh, goes on in the African American community a little bit more. Definitely. Right? You know, you don't get bogged down by that. You can take an action right now. I'll give you an example. If every state in the United States today 
said, hey, you know what? We want this law reinstated that meant that my state would be getting money for infrastructure. My state would be getting money for unemployment compensation. My state would be, would be allowed to, to, to uh, uh, issue credit through a federal program that would say we're going to restart uh, uh, truck production or tractor production or rail production or machine tool production or cement production, all those things that used to be the way that people got assimilated into an economy and built societies. Mm -hmm. We're going back to manufacturing. And we're not talking about old style manufacturing simply. We're saying we can, you can be advanced. You can have electric cars if you think you want that. You can have high speed rail. You can have a magnetically levitated train system like they have in China, mm -hmm. right? They got the trains that go 350 miles an hour. You could put that from Maine down to Florida in this country stop most of the congestion between New York and Boston airports yes. and Boston and Washington DC airports, deal with the pollution problem and all those other things and build the most advanced rail system in the world, mm -hmm. which by the way would also employ hundreds of thousands of people initially and would subsidize because of salaries, right? Millions of people mm -hmm. just doing that. See, so why is this not happening? Because we are not making it happen. Mm -hmm. That's why it's not happening. So you have to take the initiative even at the local level to make something happen. I mean, I know what you're saying. You know, don't get blogged down by the local level. But sometimes if the people in the local level is getting in your way, you got to be able to get them out of your way. Like you say, not be tied down to any particular yeah. party system neither. Don't get caught up into this party That's system. That's absolutely essential because what here's, here's what the problem is. Mm -hmm. The people who are ensconced in a lot of these party systems mm -hmm. are paid off. They're right. bought off. So if you try, and, and, and their instinct, you see, if, if you come to them and you try to make this change, mm -hmm. their instinct is to believe, oh, he just wants part of the pie we got. Well, we might have to concede that to him, but not without a fight. Right. And so it's about fighting you for your ostensible entry into the corrupt system of payoffs mm -hmm. that they're part of, whereas that's not even where you're coming from. Now, if you're not coming from there, mm -hmm. then you can't come from there. Right. And what that means is you have to have your own support system. Now, what do we have to do to do that? We have to somehow reactivate young people. Mm -hmm. We got to get people who are 19, 20 like I was, or even younger, to get involved in understanding, hey, listen, this is life and death. I mean, they definitely know they don't have a future. Mm -hmm. So, so this is where that that's a hard nut to crack. That's not an easy thing to do. No. But what I'm what I'm saying is, unless you do that, then you then you are, at best, the opposition to a corrupt system. Mm -hmm. But you are the opposition that always gets defeated. Right. That doesn't mean that it's 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 not. It's not. It's it's moral to not be the opposition and go along. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go along and get along either. Right. So you want to win. You want to oppose them, but you want to win. That's why you have to look at going into a national mode, because otherwise you don't have the support. It's like say take something as simple as the Black Panther Party. All right. People say, well, back. What do they really do? They had a lot of terrorists and this and that. Well, no, they were barely organized, but the aspiration was very important. Mm -hmm. The significance was. When the Panthers talked about the breakfast program, when they talked about teaching kids how to read, mm -hmm. when they were doing the other things they were doing and the self-defense aspect was in the background but was merely there to stop egregious violations of law by crazy racist police, mm -hmm. See, that's when you had a functioning Panther party and what would happen is that people could see or understand this from all over the country right so there's a good, good case because after all they were a political party that's why I bring it up mm -hmm. see <laughs> people don't think of them that way because they just think about the shootouts right and I'm not advocating the Panthers I'm simply trying to indicate that the idea of doing something nationally mm -hmm. is not so difficult as people imagine it to be to be yeah think about even things like the Million Man March of 1995 that was national. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Minister Louis Farrakhan called it. But people had to had to decide they were going to be 
in that march. And they, they, they did that, and they tried in many, for many months afterwards to calm things down in the African-American community, and that, in fact, happened. Well, let me address this because I just spoke to someone. Every single year, the Urban League comes out with this State of Black America a report. Tavis Smiley has been very instrumental, sometimes putting on forums and lectures throughout the country. And most urban cities probably have a chapter of the Urban League. Now, the Urban League was not actually part of the Million Man March. And I was told, I don't know if this is correct or not, that the Urban League is actually run by the Jews, and if they was to take part in the Million Man March, their fundings would get cut. It's, it's is, even worse than that. It's worse than the, that? The Urban League is one of several organizations which were created at the turn of the last century mm -hmm. for the purpose of trying to, in some fashion, um, manage or shapeshift even, <laughs> you put it that way, the... Uh, the emergence of African Americans from slavery into the urban centers of America. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to the period of 1911, 1912. Uh, the, the heads of the Urban League were generally white, but they were not Jewish. Okay. They, the, the Jewish connection is significant in terms of NAACP. Okay. Urban League was an Anglo connection. The thing to understand about America is that Jews don't run America. Anglos run America. Okay. Jews often will say they run America, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And they find this out periodically and, uh, without, without me being, and, and let me be very clear, the Jewish element in the Civil Rights Movement was a very positive element. Mm -hmm. It probably wouldn't have been a successful Civil Rights Movement without that element. However, when you're talking about this question, and it's an important one that you raise, mm -hmm. you got to look at people like the Morgans, for example, who used to run Hartford here. Mm -hmm. Junius Morgan, the father of J.P. Morgan, uh, left America during the American Civil War because of his pro-Southern stand, went to London and took his goal with him. Mm -hmm. See, so, so when you're looking at something like that, and by the way, Teddy Roosevelt, he, Teddy Roosevelt's uncle, uh, Mr. James Bullock was the head of intelligence uh, for the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. He was a British, uh, lo located also in London. Now, I'm saying all this to point out the following. The Anglo-America is Anglophile. That is, they are devoted to the British, the British outlooks, London outlooks. Okay. Now, why is this important? What people don't understand is that the biggest empire in the world today, the biggest power in, in money is London not New York. Okay. London, the British Empire. Now, it became a financial empire. So people say British Empire, where is that? That's the old and this, you know, you mean these old queen, well there is this queen. Mm -hmm. And she is the head of the Church of England. Yes. She is the head of British intelligence also, which people don't get into. Yes, yeah, she may be old, but that's what she does. Mm -hmm. Now, these people over the course of the last roughly 50 years have been moving to recolonize the United States. And when I put it that way, this was what Cecil Rhodes wrote in his last will and testament. This is the guy that founded the Rhodes Scholarship. Mm -hmm. He said, listen, here's what we're going to do. We know white people are superior to everybody else, and the English are the most superior white people. That was his thing. Okay. And other people disagreed, but that's what his thing was. He says, so what is what we're going to do? We're going to take all the English-speaking countries, Australia, New Zealand, England, Right, America, mm -hmm. and we're going to can Canada, and we're going to form something called the English Speaking Union. Now, what we do is we're going to reassimilate the United States mm -hmm. into the English Speaking Union. Okay. And our thing is real simple: we're going to run the world. Mm -hmm. Now, we know there are going to be people in other parts of the world speaking other languages, and they're going to look different ways. But we will run it, and we will recruit people who can speak English who come from all those other people, right. and whether that's from Africa, or whether that's from Asia, or whether that's from South America, they will be our people, mm -hmm. see? And so what they, what they, they, because in their mind, they'll be English. Mm -hmm. huh? Barack Obama, April 1st, 2009, get the picture, him with the queen and Prince Philip, where he bows to the queen. Now see, this is a big thing, you know, Americans don't bow, to anybody. Right. Get the picture, get the tape. Because what this is about is the way things really run. Mm. Now, Jews, Jewish people, as they say, 
have played a role when you're talking about the Rothschilds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And that's essential when you're looking at England, and that's particularly something called the Inter-Alpha Group. Yes, there's a very important group of people that have been and are at the very center of how world finance functions. This is true. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't because they were Jews. They were used because from the time of the 12th century, Jews uh, were used uh, by the Catholic Church in particular, even earlier, mm -hmm. because they did not have to subscribe to the laws against usury that were true in the Catholic Church. No, it, it was against the law to charge 25% interest, 20% interest if you were Catholic. Right. But if you were a Jewish uh, merchant, money lender, see, then you could, you could do that. And that's why, you know, in the famous Shakespeare play, The Merchant of Venice, he's a Jew, Shylock is a Jew. And he lives in what's called the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The term ghetto is a term referring to Jewish areas yes. of the cities, right? Where the financiers lived. And what they would do is, periodically, they would run these people out of town. They would kill them. They would, put, they would have pogroms against them because financial systems would go under and they would blame the Jews for it. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm saying all this to let you know, when you talk about Urban League, and you talk even about NAACP, right. these organizations, whatever may be the aspirations of the African Americans within these organizations, mm -hmm. the organization's function is pacification, is the carrying out of the policies of the English-speaking union. union. So whatever you think individually, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I more power to, to you, but you really, the best, the first thing to think is, listen, I'm an American citizen, and uh, I see what's going on, and I recognize that I have access to and recourse to the American Constitution. Mm -hmm. And like the Civil Rights Movement did, you understand, what Dr. King did. See, Dr. King didn't go through NAACP. Right. He didn't have a problem with NAACP, but he didn't go through NAACP. Uh -huh. He didn't go through Urban League. He didn't have a problem talking to people in Urban League, but he didn't go through it. He didn't go through the National Baptist Convention uh -huh. because he couldn't get them to support it. Right. They, had to, they had to form their own progressive National Baptist Convention. Uh -huh. He created the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the derivative organization, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh -huh. So he created a vehicle for the purpose of you through nonviolent direct action changing America according to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So all he would say is, listen, I read the piece of paper. Somewhere I read about the right of freedom of speech. Somewhere I read about the right of assembly. See? Mm -hmm. That's what we have to do today. So in other words, if you create your own chapter, if you are not bought into or you don't buy into the organizations that exist that is promoted in front of you, the better or the only alternative would be to create your own particular organ your own particular organization or chapter, something that you feel would have the best chance at getting your community empowered. Because I know you mentioned before that liberation and empowerment I think you said that you have to understand what that is, or basically. Well, I would have said that yeah. had I had I said it, so it's you, not a problem. You, yeah, you probably didn't say. Yeah, that. that's not <laughs> a problem. It's, 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 okay, it's, I would have said that because because the idea. You see, let's listen. When I, I was a young man, I, I met Lyndon Larouche. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, considered to be an extreme radical. I had no problem with it because the issue to me was, well, what what are you prepared to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, are we organizing something? I mean, are we going somewhere? Mm -hmm. so, so my thing is very simple. I already know from my experience of past 40 years that you can organize political action committees and you can elect people independently to office. You can organize political action committees of various types. Sometimes they're, they're not uh, 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 political party organizations. You know, I'm not saying a third party. Mm -hmm. That's up to you. You may want to do that. It may be right but a third force in American politics. Right. Well, what Adam Clayton Powell used to talk about, who actually coined the term black power mm -hmm. in a book he wrote in the 40s, where Powell's idea was, since he was the head of Abyssinia Baptist Church, which, is, which his father had built into the largest church in America before Powell, mm -hmm. um, but since he was the head of that church, he didn't have to be Republican or Democrat. Right. That is, in other words, he supported Eisenhower when Eisenhower ran in 1956, 
even though Powell's whole base was Democratic. Mm -hmm. See, because he could do that through the church. And in his original conception, what Powell was trying to do when they went after him was he was trying to unify Dr. King's movement, the Panther Party, which had just sort of come about 66, 60, 67. King was still alive then. Uh, he was trying to get the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. and, he, that's, and that's why see, he had Malcolm used to give speeches in, in Abyssinia Baptist Church. Okay. Yeah, from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what, what Adam Clayton Powell was trying to do and what he called black power was to create a, a nonpartisan or multipartisan approach to politics in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, Adam was so funny, he even had back in the period when the Communist Party retreated to Harlem back in 1954, you know, it's the only time place that the Communist Party could have an office mm -hmm. was in Harlem. Right. Uh, and, uh, and Adam used to let the communists come over. And uh, a lot of people made a lot of jokes about that. But, but the, his point was when you have, because you see Robeson, Paul Robeson's brother, was the head of Mother Zion, AME Zion Church. Mm -hmm. So although, see, Paul Robeson was not in the Communist Party. His brother was the head of AME Zion. So Adam would let them come to his church. They couldn't go to AME Zion, mm -hmm. but they could go to Adam's church. Yes. And my point in saying this kind of thing is that what black power meant in Adam's uh, mind was his ability to, as head of the House of Representatives Labor and Education Committee in the Congress, he passed more legislation through that committee than anybody else in American history. So what he was trying to do in the you know, pre-black elected officials period, there mm -hmm. were no black elected officials in the north mm -hmm. of the United States, and, or certainly not in the south, right? Okay, except for Adam and Dawson over in Illinois. That was it. It was not a black mayor. Uh, you had had Hewlin Jack, who was borough president in Manhattan. You mm -hmm. didn't have any, many black city councilmen. Stokes had not even been elected over in, 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 in uh, Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mayor uh, Gibson had not been elected in, in Newark. So, so, you know, people who know the history know that when black people, as they say, had it going on, yes. they didn't have any of these things that they have now when they have nothing going on. Right. See, so, so we can build independently. Well, it sounds like to me you're laboring a lot of this on history, and it seems like to me you understand the economic structures that exist here in this country and what really needs to be done. You mentioned in the past about we should allow the banking systems to uh, collapse and have the money diverted uh, to the people. Obviously, that did not take place, right. and it might be difficult if it happened again to uh, have it take place. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again, but will we be in a position to get access this time to the capital and not have it diverted to the banking system. Well, let me give you some hopeful news. There are 17 states right now that are have resolutions in front of them to re-implement what's called the Glass-Steagall Act. Mm -hmm. Two of those states have passed it unanimously. What this means is they're telling the Congress, their congressmen, their senators, and their congressmen in each of these states, hey, listen, I want you to put this act back in the Congress. Now, there is an act in the Congress in front of the Congress, I think it's got about 50 co-signers, okay. which is calling for this, but only in the House of Representatives. The U.S. Senate is laying out because the U.S. Senate is laying out because if the U.S. Senate has a bill also, they already know the one in the House of Representatives would pass. Mm -hmm. They don't want to debate in the Senate because the Senate is the actual seat of power in the United States on these kind of, not on financial matters. Yes. The House of Representatives is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a core of power in financial matters. So if the Senate entertains a bill and passes a bill, they already know that the House of Representatives is going to reinstate the law. Okay. If that happened, what would act, you, it would be like a revolution. Basically, what would happen is most of the banks that you now know in the United States would be gone in 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. And you would then have some chaos short term. Yeah, you have to reopen the banks. You have mainly have to get credit issued by the United States Treasury. Mm -hmm. You could also even use the Federal Reserve. You don't have to close the Federal Reserve right away, even though it's a private institution, which it is. It's called Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. but it actually is not a federal institution. It's a private banking structure with a series of banks around the United States and a private board of directors. It prints our money, but the U.S. Treasury could print our money like it used to print our money, like Kennedy once did 
back in June of 63 when he created what we call United States notes. Okay. And he just issued them through the Treasury Department. So there's not a problem. See, in other words, we could issue a dollar right now mm -hmm. coming from the United States Treasury, all right, that had more validity than the Federal Reserve note in your pocket now. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say here is that the technical measures are known. There isn't anything that has to be done technically. What uh, Barney Frank and these other people were yelling about when they did Dodd-Frank, they were yelling for their friends about how their friends were so important and the rest of us couldn't survive without their friends. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm saying to you is that there are 17 states that are doing this. If you have people in every state of this country call for this law, this law will be, will be reinforced. Okay. Um, the problem that we're going to see, you and I and others of us are going to have to deal with, is that this is like in the civil rights movement. You're not going to do this without opposition. Mm -hmm. This is like when you know Malcolm's going up and talking about you know uh, by any means necessary. You're not going to do this without opposition. Mm -hmm. See, and what people will say to you first of all is that you're irresponsible. You don't know what you're talking about. Then they say to you, "Hey, this is actually a national security measure." Okay. That's where they're going to go when you want it, because you're talking about actually collapsing the financial base of the country, mm -hmm. which we are not. We're talking about restoring the financial base of the country mm -hmm. by issuing credit from the U.S. Treasury that is earmarked to go for industrial and related uh, capabilities. So that's what we have to do. Well, Dennis Speed, we're run, we're just about out of, we're actually out of time. Let's leave it on a positive note that this system can be changed. It just has to be changed the right way this time. And by I, us. And by us, the people. Not by Obama. He ain't going to do it. Okay. Well, hopefully we can have you back sometime in the future for a part two segment and we can do a store follow up and come up with a better plan. But you outlined everything this morning perfectly. I appreciate Dennis Speed, my guest this morning, coming from New Jersey to be my guest here at All About You. There's other good programs on this network. And until the next time, everybody out there, be blessed and have the faith. And I keep the faith. Thank you.